Okay, great. So especially if people are uh, watching it online, I'll do it in English. Um, this is the first generation of the talk. There will be a second at the Open Source Summit in London, for example. So this is evolving. If you have feedback, please let me know. The other people watching this talk will thankfully accept it. <laughs> um, so, a little introduction from my side. Um, I started off as a developer in PHP, realized PHP is not the best idea for the stuff I'm doing. So at some point in time, I really migrated to doing more operations than what people call DevOps. Uh, I started instructing people, um, but mainly when I write code, it's mostly Go and Python nowadays. I've done lots of stuff in Node.js, uh, specifically or more specifically Py uh, TypeScript. Um, I have a long history in Puppet. I have a much shorter history in Ansible, um, especially Bash scripts in Ansible is the way we go nowadays. <laughs> Um, I do lots of stuff on Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes, however you want to pronounce it. Uh, I contribute to Kubernetes, um, do lots of stuff with AWS and Google Cloud, um, yeah, namely contribute to Kubernetes and uh, a project called Kaniko, which we'll, we will be speaking about today. Um, and well, I helped FrostCon since I think 2012 or something like that. Um, I also organize Agile user groups, but um, as to this tech, you can find me on GitHub uh, and on, well, the name was taken on Twitter, but uh, GitHub is the way to go. First of all, who has already worked with containers? Build your own images or just run containers? Build? Great. But what you did was probably docker build minus t, give it a name, run it, you needed root for that. Um, very fun things. Okay, also um, on the other side, who knows what a container is, like technically in the system? A few. Okay, so in the basics, containers are nothing new. Everyone is like saying docker, the new big thing, how we do IT operations. Especially I see corporates being very, very picky and saying, oh, this is so new, it's going to break in production and everything. In fact, Docker is not new. There used to be a technology called Linux vServer. Um, change root is probably very similar to it. Any, like the only thing Docker does is really um, tell the kernel how to set C groups, how to set kernel namespaces correctly and mount a um, layered file system on the machine to actually store the data. So in fact, when you run Docker container, you can do it without Docker. You don't need Docker for that. The only thing Docker does is talk to the kernel, making this APIs more accessible. But you can do it with systemd as well. There are lots of APIs you can actually do this. And this is also kind of the knowledge you need to know because of otherwise it wouldn't be able to build Docker images without Docker. In fact, well, a very small tool would be RunC. You can run Docker containers using RunC. Meaning containers are everywhere you probably use them without realizing it's Docker, even if you didn't know it was Docker. In fact, they are really everywhere. Um, so the second you type a search query into Google is when, it's, when a Docker container launches and actually operates something. So every search will be run in a Docker container. When you open up Gmail or any other email client, especially Gmail is completely, you get your own container where you actually operate in, and once you log out, the container is destroyed. This makes it very adaptable, flexible, and fast. Um, so talking about basics, the thing is, a Docker container is really, um, I, I didn't find a better picture of a hole, I'm afraid. Uh, so it's like a hole. When you are root on the system, you can see what's running. It's just another process on the system. So it's nothing special, nothing isolated. There is no technology from Docker around the container. It's just a process running on the system meaning you can just use the kill command to actually terminate the process. You could do other things, uh, things with it. You could send it um, other kill commands, for example. Um, the only thing what you can't do is when you're in the hole or when you're in the container, see what else is running on the system. So in the box, you have uh, process ID one and every sub child processes you launch are in your own namespace. Also, Docker moves user IDs um, around so that if you're root in the Docker container, you don't have root on the main system. So there are some protections. But in general, when you're in the container, you don't see what's outside. But in order to run containers, you need to be on the outside. You need to be able to actually execute stuff on the machine, which in most cases is you're either root or in the Docker user group on the system. 
Um, so, pretty simply put, it's an API with networking plugins. You attach a file system. It's very much a format for containers. So it's been around for a long time. People used it more or less. I know a web hosting company who built their entire infrastructure using what we now would call containers. Um, just they called it virtual service. Um, and they sold it, and people were happy with it. So it's just another format on how you actually package your applications. It's very important to know. So an image is like a template. A layer template, meaning we actually say we start with something and then we build on top of it. If we have one change, we then add new files, we store this change, we create a new layer, we run a command, and then we persist this again. Very efficient, especially if you want to use caching. Um, like my worst nightmare is when I need to install um, Python uh, libraries, just because of pip can be quite slow, especially if there is a proxy in front of it. With Docker, I can use one layer to actually install the dependencies and just add my code in the, sec in the layer on top of it meaning I can just start adding my new cha code changes without rebuilding the entire libraries from the, from the bottom. So you always have layers um, that build on top of each other, but you only store the delta. Um, but all layers are read-only, meaning as soon as you have created the layer, it is frozen, you cannot change it. If you want to change a layer in the middle, you'd need to build all layers on top of it because if you just store the delta, and you cannot change the layer that you already have. So you're always rebuilding the stuff that you're changing. Important to know if you want to build your own Docker layers. Also, what many people don't know, and this is really just a thing you can actually do if you do this without Docker, um, they're commented. Every layer in Docker has a comment. Uh, so when you open it up, which we'll do in a minute, you can actually read when and how this layer was actually created. And this is what we can also, if we use other toolings, for example, Kaniko, can use to actually say, hey, we did this in the following way. This is how we created it. So we can add comments. In a picture, this is how it looks like. We start with a bottom layer, which can be basic implementation of we just installed um, Ubuntu libraries and binaries, stuff like that. Um, and then we add our changes, and the only real layer where we can add data to is the union mount point, which is the layer Docker actually mounts into the process that's actually executed. Meaning there, this is where you can actually write data to, but this is what will get dropped when the container stops running. So when you delete the container, all those changes would be gone if you don't use save before you actually, or export the container before you actually shut it down. So in terms of persistence, Docker is really for stateless applications. Saving data in Docker containers is not often a good idea. Um, use other technologies for that as little uh, input in that regard. But again, those layers are completely frozen. They are read-only. If you change this layer, those two layers have to be rebuilt as well. But this will be leftover data on your machine, meaning if you want to keep the, the system slow, think about actually just removing the deltas that are not referenced anywhere, anyone, anywhere as well. This is, for example, what Git does with the garbage collector as well. Just remove all the layers, all the data that has no pointer to it anymore. And we just built on top of those pointers. In terms of metadata, those layers does not, do not have to contain data. Like a layer in Docker could also be a statement telling, when you start this container, run the following command. This doesn't have to change data in the layer because of it's just an, um, an input field saying, hey, when you do this, this is how you should start it if the, if the person doesn't want to do something else. It doesn't change data. Still, in Docker, you need a layer to actually persist stuff in the image. So this is, yeah, you could say an empty layer. It just exists to, to contain this statement, this configuration piece. Yeah. Other questions to that so far? We will look into that uh, in a minute. So, in a minute is now. First demo time, let's see if this works well. Let me see, let me tell me if it's big enough, actually. So, um, opening this up, this is, I created a Docker file. This is my very basic Docker file. Um, all I'm really doing is take the, the latest base image from Docker up, which is Ubuntu, uh, from Ubuntu, 
and then I copied a little, little shell script into it, meaning a second layer where just demo is added to the, to the actual container. And then we say with CMD, when you run this container, execute the following script. The script is also very simple. It's just a simple echo foo. But yeah, so in the old days, what I would actually do is if I just go to a console, um, if I say just run Docker, this is the right folder. Yeah, so what I would do is say Docker build minus T to just give it a name and then say, well, build this for me. So what it will do is if I wouldn't have already had on the machine download the, the latest Ubuntu images from Docker Hub, then copy the file, generate a new layer, do the next thing, actually set the CMD to demo. And now if I just run docker run test, what it will do, it will actually ex output the, the thing from my script. This is what everyone knows about Docker, right? So this is everyone who, who has done it. This is probably what you know. The thing is what I can do is, um, now that I've built this, is I can actually Docker save the image, um, the image I've created called test to a file. And this would just like create a tar archive, like just a packaged version of my image. Very useful, for example, I've done a course at Fraunhofer Institute. They needed, they had very privileged environments. So the only thing they could bring into was a USB drive. So you could just take your images, bring them into your privileged environments, plug them in, import the image, and you could use them there. You don't need public internet to actually transport files using Docker. You can just re-import them. And then once we export what we've just created, you end up with a folder structure like this. So we have, we have folders with shard names. We have a um, list of repositories, which just tells me, well, in the repository, what's the, uh, the reference identifier. And we have a manifest. Let me actually prettify that. So what we see here is um, a few things. This is what Docker reads when it actually looks into the images. We see the configuration for this image is in the following file, which is c64 blah, 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 dot JSON. This is where you actually pull all the information about the image you need to know. It's all in this file. We also say where it was exported it is known or tagged the following way. So in my, my own minus T with just test, it just automatically tagged it using the version latest and it saved it that way. And then here I get the list of all the different layer tar archives which Docker created when it actually persisted the images. I have a few more than three, just because of Ubuntu has three in itself. So in this export, I also get the base image layers that I just downloaded and then all the rest. And now in the next step, I can look into, uh, into the configuration. And let me prettify that as well. Um, go to the beginning. So what we see here is this is what Docker needs to know to actually execute a container. So it is built on AMD 64. I cannot do this on 32-bit environments, um, especially, for example, this needs a special host name or attached things, like everything I could configure. I also find what's the command that is executed per default. I see what's the image ID, what are the containers, and here I also see the created by command, the comment, you could say. So I see when was the layer created, and what's the command or what's the comment that Docker actually added to it? So using this, I can actually revert, in some case, depending on how you build it, even reverse engineer how this container was built without having access to the Docker file. So I can just look into the, uh, into the JSON, that's the configuration, and I can see what's actually happened. Here, for example, I see, well, the following thing, just added the CMD bin bash. So it's an empty layer, it's true. Why? Because of, well, in the tar archive, there would be no data. Like there is no files that change, meaning there is no tar archive you need to extract to actually make this layer work. And then in the folders, I just get all my layers. So I have a tar archive version of the file system changes. And then here I have things like also JSONs, which is 
the configuration at that point in time. So if I look in the Docker container, when it just said from Ubuntu, my configuration was completely empty. I didn't even have a command to run when I start the container. So at this point, with this layer, the configuration looked the following way. And in the next level, I also get the new version of the configuration that was applied. And so I can just go through the different layers and actually like put them on top of each other to get to the latest version, also extract the first tar archive, then extract the next tar archive, in order to build a file system that looks the way I actually need it to look like in my layered file system. Does that make sense? Yeah? No? Maybe? <laughs> yeah. So the thing is, if I look into the next one here, um, what I could actually see is... Uh, there was not a pretty file. Pretty. So here I see it's still empty. I think the last one was one of the more final ones. Um, no, it wasn't. Let me actually find a JSON where it's something more in there. Um, also not. So probably one of those. Oh, so here, I, for example, I can see this is probably the layer when the CMD was already set. So in this file, now what I can see, there is a command set. And this is, well, how you can actually, yeah, really reverse engineer what's actually happened, but also how Docker understands, or the Docker engine understands images. What you need to understand here is, as soon as you know, or you, you're able to assemble a tar archive with the content like this, you can actually create it all the way you want, and Docker would be able to import it. Like, that's the only file format you need to know to actually run Docker containers. It's just tar archives of the diffs, including the folders where the diff actually occurred, and the configuration in a, well, JSON format layered on top of each other. So, when we go back to the slides, the thing is, I already said it, Docker build requires access to the Docker API. Meaning, if you want to build a Docker container automatically, manually, wherever you want, you would need access to the Docker API. This can be using TCP IP, this can be using IPv6, this can be the socket on the machine, doesn't matter, but you need full access to the Docker API. Like, there is nothing like credentials being, okay, well, with user Chris, you could actually just build containers, but you can only run containers for yourself, you cannot look into the other containers. With Docker, as of now, it's really all or nothing. Meaning, um, especially if you, want, if you have a build infrastructure, security and operations teams would love to argue with you, but they will always win and they tell you, you don't get root access to my build infrastructure, um, and you're not allowed to just mess with the Docker containers of the other people. Right? Someone disagrees, maybe? <laughs> cool. So the thing is, you don't want root in your build infrastructure, but you need it in order to assemble Docker containers. There's some ways around this, like Gvisor and stuff like that. You could use a virtual machine to actually do it, but this is very painful. Like, we've tried to do it in GitLab CI. We've massively failed, and we just, like, brought in our own build server where we actually got root to actually do it. Um, so, depending on how limited you are, building Docker containers using Docker itself can be a time effort that is time not really well spent. Like, you can get to a point where it works, but it's very expensive to actually do so. Um, especially if there are better ways. And the better way is called, one of the ways is called Kaniko. Um, it's a rather new tool, so I think it was announced when a friend of mine told me, yeah, we at Google and now just like open source 29 of our newest projects. Um, we've just been working on them for 1.5 months or something, um, but they had like 5 million in funding, so that's how <laughs> the project pretty much came into play. So Google needed to find a way for Google Cloud customers to build Docker containers in Google Cloud. And this is really where Carnico comes from. This is Google's solution for building Docker containers in that regard, especially on Google Cloud. It's Apache 2.0 licensed, um, completely written in Go, um, and it really works anywhere. So you can compile it by yourself, you can use the pre-built Docker containers where it runs in, execute it in a bash script on your local machine, it doesn't matter. So it has no external dependencies, you have access to all the source code, and it's built using a make file. So everywhere where you can install Go, you can just simply go install it. 
if you look at the readme file, the main instructions are really, this is how you do it on Google Cloud Kubernetes engine. Um, and it completely works, and my demo will be in there as well because of it works so simply. But still, you can use it anywhere. The only thing is if you use the prepackaged um, container, it will be hosted on Google Container Registry. So you might want to just pull that and upload it to your own private repository to, to ensure it's there. But yeah, so how does it look like? The thing is, what Kaniko tries to do is emulate the, the build of the actual layers. So what it will do is it replicates the steps as Docker would do. The only thing it can't do is really have the layered file system. So because of it's already running in a container, it doesn't really have access to running their own file systems, meaning there are different engines to actually emulate the delta generation. Anything else is pretty much like Docker. Plus, there is one folder which is called slash Kaniko, which will be in the container when you boot it up, where there will be a executable called executor. And this executor is the entry point for Docker, which will then download the context and actually execute the different steps on top of each other. Um, the, yeah, coming back to the context, so in Docker you always, even in my example here, in, when I said build this, I have a Docker file and also need the demo.sh file. Right, So I need my context where the files are taken from that Docker actually needs to build the image. I can't just yeah, say, well, they're somewhere on my drive, like just pull them. They need to be in a folder, Docker's actually accessing it. In Kaniko, this can be a local file, this can be a Google Cloud Storage bucket, or this can be an Amazon S3 bucket. But it's, um, well, it wasn't, but I made it pretty pluggable because of I needed it with AWS. Uh, so now it's pretty simple to just like write, I don't know, 50 lines of code and you can edit, add any storage engine you can actually imagine. Like all you need to do is register it in the code and say, if someone wants to pull it, this is how to download it. And in the second step, this is how to extract it. So the end result Kaniko needs is just a folder where the context is laying from, where it's just taking the, picking the data from it, moving them around in the file system. And then... Um, all you'd really need to do, especially in Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes is, in this folder I already created the following file, um, deploy it as a job, deploy it as a pod, or locally run it as a Docker container. And what you can see here it, uh, is, even that is pretty straightforward. All you do is you say, um, give it a name, name is always nice, uh, then say, this is where to pull the image from. So on Google Container Registry, uh, the Kaniko project just has this public space where everyone on the internet can actually pull this Docker image from. Like this is just the base. You don't build it in a specific Docker image, you just pull it and then execute stuff in it. And then you specify where is the tar archive that I need to extract to actually yeah, build my container with. And in my example, I just created a bucket on Google, uh, on Google Cloud and I uploaded a context.targz archive, which is just a tar of the folder with my Docker file and the shell script in it. It's like on my local machine, it's just a tar of the folder I was in when I run the Docker build, nothing else. And then in the next step, I also say as a destination, when you're done building, please push it to the following repository. So every, the only thing this thing really knows or needs is, hey, this is the registry you actually need to talk to, you need to be able to push there, uh, otherwise the, the container will actually fail. Um, but anything else is really pretty simple. Like what we do in the next steps is just mount a Kubernetes secret, which is called um, Kaniko secret. But um, this is just the Google application credentials, meaning I need access to the Google container bucket, like the bucket just to pull the tar archive I've uploaded in the step before. Right, so if I want to actually access a bucket on Google Cloud if it's not public, I cannot just go there and download it, uh, no matter if it's in the Kubernetes hosted by Google or not, I need the credentials. And using the secret, I just added the credentials. Like, pretty straightforward. Well, can be AWS credentials, but then I'd also need to use another environment variable name and all that stuff. So just natively, as you would talk to the APIs, you need to give the credentials to the engine. And then I say, well, if, the, um, if this thing actually fails building, I want the run to actually restart it up until back of limit four, four times, because if it fails four times, probably something else is broken. 
but um, if it fails the first time, maybe I just had a network issue to the, to the source where I actually downloaded stuff from. Or in other cases, my base image is just not available because of Docker Hub is some pro have, having some issues or stuff like that. Meaning using the restart policy and, for example, a backup limit of four, I can ensure it's really my fault and not someone else's fault. Um, yeah, and that's pretty much what I will do. I just say, um, clear that, um, kubectl apply minus f job drama. And what it will just do is talk to the Kubernetes cluster I've spun up. Um, and now I got a pod that is running. And we can just look um, look, look, uh, look into it. And this, is, this would be the output. So this is Kaniko doing what it's actually supposed to do. If we go through here, first of all, we start with um, yeah, downloading base image Ubuntu. So because of it's from Ubuntu, Kaniko needs all the files that would be in the Ubuntu image. So it will just download them from Docker Hub as anyone else would. The next step, it says, um, yeah, well, here we have a little problem for a forward fetching URL metadata, but that's Google internal networking. Well, now that it got the data, it will unpack the layer and apply them on top of each other. Then, yeah, for next, whiting out some folders because of when you download stuff, things like aptitude will actually do stuff on your system that is not owed the fact that you're running Docker build. Meaning, because of Carnico is just running in a Docker container as an executable, it will trigger stuff on the system that actually changes data that you don't want in your Docker container. So it is really blacklisting some folders where the system is really doing stuff by itself to just grab the delta that is really relevant for you in the container. You can actually influence which folders you want included and which not. But this is really, you could say, the magic Kaniko tries to emulate because of it doesn't have access to a native file system that, that employs this. Again, you can change the providers. This is up to you. But then again, you don't want one gigabyte Docker images. And this is really sorting out all the caching um, and stuff like that. Um, yeah. Here, next step, we see not adding at, at ETC because it was added by a prior layer. So yeah, also here, we try to whiten out folders that have not changed since the last layer we've built to not like create a delta out of everything we do and just the delta would be the entire file system. So we, we try to really match using timestamps and change more um, and um, checksums what has changed and what hasn't changed and see what's going on in my system. Yeah, we have whitelisted stuff like especially dev devices. You don't want a dev STD out in your Docker image. Um, yeah. And then in the end, if we go a little further, we see taking snapshots. So this would be the, the base layer. Next step would be cmd copy demo.sh to destination slash demo.sh. So here what it has done is take the demo.sh file from the build context and put it in the container. In my Docker file, this would be the copy command. Um, and then it said, well, taking snapshot of files and the only file included because of the only file that changed is demo.sh. And this would be the next layer in my image that Kaniko is building. Then the next thing is um, CMD. So it says, well, in my config file, replace the config step with bin sh minus c demo.sh. And then again, no files change in this command. Kaniko would even skip creating the snapshot because of nothing changed and it realized that. So it's just adding an empty layer, which is doing stuff. And then in the end, it realized, well, I'm done. And then it is pushing it to Google Container Registry. When I go into my browser, into the container registry, here you can see it is empty. And when I hit refresh, I can now see there is my image that Carnico has created and uploaded to this Google Cloud Platform environment, where I could now simply pull it. So what I will do next is, um, whoops, that was the wrong button. What I will do is copy the repository name. And in my container, uh, come on, bigger. So when I say um, docker run, I use minus minus rm because if I don't want the leftover, but anything else, it realized I don't have it locally. So let's pull it. It just downloaded it, and you can see the output foo as it has done when I created the test image. And now in the next step, let's actually um, docker export, uh, save the image I've just created. Not foo. Copy the following thing. 
to a new file. And now if I, well, let's actually make a directory. Uh, and in temp, I will actually just untar the new archive. Oh. Most favorite command of mine. So now I can actually see here is again a six subdirectories for the six levels thing. I have the manifest JSON, and yeah. So if I open this up in Atom, what I will see is let's just open up a new window. Um, and in here, we say add a workspace folder, go to my directory. I think it wasn't this one. No, this one. No, wrong one. Where the hell am I located here? Um, code doc. Oh, it is in the completely wrong directory. Um, so what I will see here is now again, if I look into my um, repositories file, I see this originated the Google Container Registry in my project space in my Kaniko demo with the following hash. So, well, if the hash changed, I'd probably need to repull it. I also see my manifest JSON, which says pretty fi JSON, which says, well, those are the following layers, repository tag, configuration. In my configuration, I see pretty much the same thing, just in a different order. So in the history, I really see, well, I have no author, but the comment is pretty identical than when we've created it as well. We see the different layers. Um, here we see empty layer. What we've added is the CMD to bin dot uh, to bin bash. We have the timestamp when it was created, and we also see here by Carnico that is really the file that changed was created by the Carnico engine and not by a pre-existing layer, for example. Down here we still see the layers in its different in its correct order, and we also see the entire configuration. For example, with CMD, this is the command you actually need to execute when you run a container. You see all the things you have seen before. And well, we have all the different layers in your, um, in your other folders that actually specify the layer. Just that as you have seen in Kubernetes, I haven't specified to run it as root. I haven't told it to actually get any mount to the socket or anything. I've just run it in a basic Docker container as any user, any one of you could do on your local machine, even if it's a highly privileged environment. So I could just do it wherever the hell I want, which is yeah, pretty useful for many people that actually need to run Docker build Docker containers, especially in automated manners. If you do it by yourself on your local computer, that's probably fine. But I've just seen so many people who say, we don't want you to build it locally, or we need to build it in a more autonomous way, or we're simply not allowed to give you the credentials to actually even do it on your own computer. And using this technology by just like emulating how Docker is behaving, we can actually build it in many other ways. Like we could even do it completely manual by ourselves on a computer and just like create our archives all the time. Um, again, if you want to, I don't recommend you to actually create 20 tar archives on a daily basis. That's not fun at all. But still, it would work. Like Docker is not really magic. It is just a package format to actually transmit data. Meaning when we understand how it actually operates, we can do it by ourselves as well. If we know how to talk to the kernel, we could also change the namespaces, change the C groups by ourselves. We could put two containers in the same C group. We just need to know how to talk to the kernel. And Docker just knows how to do the kernel and giving you a, well, easy to use networking API and easy to use file systems API around it. Like it's just making it a nice package, but all the technology is out in the market and is open source for years. Um, so you should definitely just like try to experiment, get into it, how it really works. Um, but I think this is really also stealing lots of people, lots of fear against Docker containers, even in production. I've talked to too many people who said, I can run Minecraft on my production then. Um, so yeah, it's not magic. On the other side, if you're concerned, you could also use this knowledge to think about how can I actually validate people are not running Minecraft in my cluster? Because of now that you know how it, it's actually packaged, you could of course also unpackage it and scan it using other technology that you maybe already have at hand. So it's really just opening up a tar archive, looking into it, and then working with that. 
And this is the only way you actually work with Docker containers, which even Docker is using to do it. Just that it's a, an executable, which you'd need to go through thousand lines of code to actually understand it. And that would be it from my presentation about Docker and how it actually works under the hood. Thank you. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. Uh, he is coming, maybe someone in the back where he's quicker as the first one. <laughs> I can actually just... Uh, so, uh, thanks for the talk, Chris. Um, the question is, um, are multi-stage builds already supported by Kaniko? Uh, not, f like, there is a, there is a uh, branch, they are working on it. Google is actively pushing it because of that's like the most requested feature request as well. <laughs> Uh, but it's not yet, like, I th it could be final right now, so they, I just haven't looked into the repository for like one or two weeks, uh, but I know they have been working and they have been reviewing stuff around that, yeah. Let me actually just go over there. Well, yeah. Well, I, I actually have two questions. Mm -hmm. First is on a side note you did in, in, in the first part of your speech, mm -hmm. that uh, Docker engine uses uh, UI mapping already. My knowledge is about a half year old with the standard Docker implementation. It didn't yet. Was there? Anything? Yes, so that you're not, <laughs> if you root in the Docker, you're not root at the host machine. You uh, no. add mapping. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, um, I don't know when it actually came in. I know Docker actually, like it, the implementation is it just adds a certain number to the UID in the container, and this would be the UID on the outer system. So especially when you use NFS, what you need to do is you need to understand how Docker is like shifting the UIDs, yeah. and then you can also use NFS permissions in your container. I, know, I don't know how old it is, but I know that it actually works. <laughs> okay, and second question is, uh, this upload to the Google um, container uh, host isn't <laughs> necessary, it was just a matter of your demo. Exactly. So you can pretty much upload it anywhere to Docker Hub. You don't even need to. Like there is native give me the tar archive output as well. Um, but the, the, like this is rather new that Kaniko actually outputs a tar archive. So especially if it's in a container, getting data out of a container is usually not what you want to do. So it's always a bit more painful. And the, the first version was solely uploaded to, to any container registry where you have access to. But now you can actually just upload, like get the tar archive, upload it to private registries. The only precondition is you need credentials in the container that's actually doing it. So upload it wherever you want. Other questions? Yep. Oh, he's quick. <laughs> I have a question about permissions. Mm -hmm. um, Kaniko, as I understand it, just applies these layers by extracting one, second, yeah. third. So you don't have the file system layers. And uh, how about permissions? Because you said normally the layers are read-only, so how does it work with Kaniko? Um, so the layers are read-only because of Docker doesn't allow you to actually modify what's in the tar archive, and also because of the next layers are built under the, 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 you could say, well, the, the precondition that the other files look the way they looked when the Delta was compiled. Um, so... Well, even in Docker, you actually could change it if you extract it, the archive, change it, and then repackage it. And Kaniko, well, it just uses this way of creating the image, but Docker is not doing something else. It's just read-only, especially in Docker, because of the file system engine that's used to compile it is already natively implemented in a way that you cannot mess with it. But in general, well, if you extract it, well, it's just a file, right? You could, you could mess with any data if you just know how to. Um, and if you un unbox it and rebox it, this is how you would actually do it in Docker as well. Yeah. So again, the layered file system is just helping Docker out to make it more efficient because of it knows how to compile the deltas natively and it's built in C to, to mess with it. Kaniko needs to figure this out using, um, using timestamps, using, uh, using checksums, and computing checksums just takes a little more time. Um, but it's pretty much the, the only way we have found to date to actually do it. So if you know a better way, feel free. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Other questions?
No. Not that I can see. Video team says no. OK. <laughs> Perfect. Well, then, thank you. Enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs> yeah.